So our first speaker today is going to be Alex. He will be speaking about learning to BIM. Uh, so I expect one of you in the future to do a talk about Emacs. Yeah, we need to cover the board. <laughs> and after that, we're going to have Cameron, Emily, and Sarah. They'll be presenting together. They'll be speaking about their experiences becoming a dev in a very short time. <laughs> And finally, we're going to have Peter, who's going to do a talk about location-based storytelling using mobile technology. Okay? Uh, so, we're going to get started right now. There's a lot of talks to go through, so let's welcome Alex to the stage. Alex? So, uh, like I said, it's keyword shortcuts on steroids. 
So you interact with them through a constant series of uh, keywords, which are can be subjects, nouns, and verbs, kind of like a natural language, and you can combine them to do really powerful things. So for instance, if you do CI bracket in Vim, it kind of translates to change in parentheses. So instead of selecting something between two brackets or braces, you can do this and then start typing. So small shortcuts like this really help your productivity once you get used to them. Vim is also super old. It's been around since the basically the 70s. It started with a project called VI by this guy, Bill Joy. And then uh, 1991 was when kind of Vim, which has been VI approved, came up. So it's been around for quite a while. So if you like your music analog and your copy of your trade, you will love Vim. <laughs> so why should you use Vim? Why should you try it out? Well, for one thing, it's fast, because there's basically no load time. It's portable. Vim is already installed on your computer if you've got a Mac or a Linux box. And the uh, configuration files are really portable. There's text files so you can create around with you to other computers and be productive right away. And last but not least, it looks really cool. So I'm going to give a quick demo of it. Because uh, when I first saw people using it, you know, when you see people using it, they're so fast that usually you don't really know what's going on. So I thought I would slow it down a little bit and uh, just give you a kind of a small taste of what you can do. Okay, so you can start Vim just by going Vim uh, and enter a file. So the first thing to note is uh, that normal mode down there. So you are not always in text editing mode. So when I do something like uh, moving around, oh, the shortcuts aren't working. Anyway. So when I'm moving around, I'm pressing HJKL. It's not actually inserting anything. This is how I can move around. So if I want to actually insert something in type, I can hit I to get into the insert mode. And now, anything I type is actually uh, put into the document. So that's the first thing. If you want to get out of insert mode, you just hit escape. And I'm just going to try to bring the shortcuts back on, because it's very handy. Okay. So now let's say that I want to do something pretty common, which is, uh, you can see on line 11 that it says I'm using current user. I actually want that to just be at user. So in another editor, I might go and select that with the mouse and edit it again. But what I can do here is I can just say, I want to go, I'm going to use J to move down one, oops. <laughs> I want to use uh, J to move down one line. Now I want to go to the first bracket and I want to change everything in that bracket. Now I'm in insert mode, so I can just go at user, and then hit escape to just get back to normal mode. Now there's another one, there's another one down there a couple lines down. So instead of doing the same thing again, I can go down by three lines, and I could do the same thing again, I could go change in brackets, or Vim levels keeps the the last kind of editing thing you did in a shortcut, which is period, so I can just hit period to replace that with user. Um, and then obviously you can uh, you need to save and quit your files, so you hit colon W, and that'll write the file. Uh, getting out of it, you just hit colon Q, and that'll quit. So there's a lot more, obviously, but I thought that would be a really good quick example of the kind of things that you might not be able to do easily with another. So with that, getting back to it, uh, if you want to get started, if you want to play around, I've got some tips for you. The first tip, don't go cold turkey. It's uh, pretty intimidating at first because you don't have access to the mouse really when you're using them, so it gets hard, uh, takes a while to get used to if you're not used to it. Uh, I kind of uh, bounced between Adam and Vim for the first week or two that I was using it, and then after about a week I found, after two weeks I just found that it was even though I wasn't as fast as I was in Vim by, the, by that time, I just stuck with Vim because it was 
easier and I've got faster over time. And it will reduce your frustration factor if you don't just kind of try to use it all the time right away. Uh, also, focus on your must-haves. So kind of figure out what you use a lot in your current text editor. For me, this was navigating a file tree, um, indenting and dedenting text, and moving large blocks of text when you're recapturing methods. So figure out what those are for you, and figure out how to do it in Vim, and then you won't be as frustrated when you're if, when you're not able to kind of move as fast as you're used to. Uh, don't use the arrow keys. So uh, H, J, K, and L, as I was using before, it, you can use that to go, you know, move around up and down, left and right in the document. And it feels really weird at first, but it has the really good advantage that you stay on the home row, so you're really fast. So you don't even have to move like slightly down to do stuff with the arrow keys. Stop and think. So all those things I showed you, like F bracket, change in bracket, all that stuff, uh, you don't have to use it because you can just peck around like you normally would. But the more the more of that stuff you use, uh, the faster you'll be. So kind of try to think about how how you might be able to be faster. There we go. So yeah, think about think about that as you're doing. The more you get used to it, the faster you'll go. And this goes without saying, but back up your files. Not only because it's good if you have. <laughs> not only is it good if you have like a you know computer failure or whatever, but it's also really good if you have like a GitHub repo of all your doc files and your configuration files. You can just really quickly jump on another computer and be productive again. I found this uh, a while ago in Bootstrap. Uh, it lets you auto-generate a Vim config, so you don't need to spend a lot of time setting it up. So you just choose the languages that you usually use, hit generate, and it'll make a file for you with a bunch of good shortcuts. I'll put this, these slides up on the Meetup site, but there's some really other, other really good resources that helped me a lot when I was first learning. And I know if you follow these and other tips, you will be an expert in no time. And so that's it for me. Thanks, everyone. Support for all the commands is not always like excellent, so it depends on which one you're using. All right, well, thank, thank you, you, Alex. Thank you. And
Um, so we wanted to come today and speak with you guys about um, going through uh, kind of like a coding school. Uh, we, uh, the three of us went through uh, this winter uh, Redicon, which is a 12-week program, taught us uh, basically everything um, uh, you know about front front end uh, web design and web development. Uh, so yeah, so that's kind of what we just kind of want to talk about. So when we thought about this presentation, we thought about it in the uh, kind of realm of wanting to tell a story. You know, the 12-week process that we went through uh, ultimately was, you know, kind of just ran into this similar thing of maybe Joseph Campbell's uh, Hero's Journey or your classic story arc, um, where you have, you know, kind of your introduction, rising action, climax, falling action, and resolution. So uh, when you look at kind of the uh, story arc, you, you know, you're introduced into something new, you go through your program, you go through kind of like building up and seeing, uh, as you can see in the story arc, little climaxes as they go, uh, up to a point where uh, in uh, Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey, he calls it the abyss, where you feel like you're never gonna be able to get out of anything. Uh, and then you have like a, you know, a transformation, a resolution, you pass through that climax and, uh, and ultimately you change the method. So that's uh, kind of what we wanted to talk about. So uh, we'll start about um, with our exposition, who we are. Uh, so. All right, so my name is Sarah, and I came into Red Academy because I wasn't really satisfied with any of the jobs that I had after I graduated from university, and I also really wanted to get into the tech community in Vancouver. I spent some time in Rio de Janeiro last year, and I was really inspired by the startup community there. So I, yeah, I wanted to like come back to Vancouver, like check out the tech community here, and I actually took a little one-day workshop with Ligas and the Code. It was actually held here in January, and there I chatted with a past graduate from the Red program. And after chatting with her and checking out the school, I knew that this was what I wanted to do. So yeah, I took the leap. Hi, I'm Ellie, um, and uh, I kind of got into being interested in websites about like four years ago when I wanted to start a food blog, and I got onto WordPress.com, and I was immediately frustrated that I had like no control over customizing it the way I wanted to. So I started looking into how I could actually have control over a whole website, and uh, realized I needed to learn how to code. So I started doing um, tutorials on Treehouse, and then I also took some design classes at Emily Carr because I realized I wanted to like have some Photoshop skills and Illustrator skills to make beautiful graphics. Um, I did their interactive design program, and uh, after that, I freelanced for a little bit. Um, but I still really wanted to um, do custom work because I was really just doing WordPress theme customizations at that point. Um, so I was at this dinner party one day with some people I had met at Legos Labs, and uh, Elgin, who maybe some of you have met, she's spoken with before. She was there, and she spoke really highly of Red, and she had just graduated. So I looked up the website, and uh, sure enough, the program started on Monday, and this was like Friday. And I had to make like a big decision, but I took the leap, and uh, I definitely don't regret it at all. Um, I actually um, moved here from uh, New York City. Uh, um, Four or five months ago now, actually, uh, and I moved here. Didn't uh, have any kind of real experience in uh, development at all. I maybe launched a WordPress site once or twice before, but really had no uh, experience. Never looked at a, a code editor before, so it was really diving headfirst into it. Uh, I have a background in writing and filmmaking, so I wanted to do something that I could combine kind of those skills, the creativity, um, and do something that was really like uh, interesting and. You know, could really impact a positive change, and it seemed that like this was really a great program and a great, um, you know, way of doing that. So that's kind of how we all, all got there. Um, through the program, we, uh, you know, started off with kind of your basic stuff, HTML, CSS, and it felt uh, pretty uh, good right off the bat. You know, like, you know, we got this. All right, this is good. You know, we're leading in. You know, I mean. Yeah, like I had a, I had already done a lot of HTML CSS, so I definitely felt like I was like, oh, this program could be great, like I'm killing it already. But you know, it's CSS, so it's obviously going to get a little bit more intense. <laughs> I unfortunately didn't have such a positive experience. <laughs> um, even within the first few weeks, I felt extremely overwhelmed. Uh, I realized that the pace of the course was going to be very fast, and I like to go into lots of depth when I learn things, so that was going to be a challenge. And I also felt a little bit of a, like a fraud because. People were, were coming in with experience or like people were self-taught and I yeah basically just signed up for the course like two days before it started so I didn't even have like any sort of code academy <laughs> done so yeah I was really 
jumping in head first. So yeah, but luckily I had a great peers that helped me out and set for flow. Um, and so like uh, going through HTML and CSS was like, uh, you know, the first couple of weeks, learning things like Flexbox and uh, some of the like, best practices was, you know, a really good pro uh, process. But then we started really getting into like, you know, the, the you know, struggles of everything uh, and really JavaScript. And I really like, I, I think when you get into learning a uh, programmatic language like JavaScript, it was, um, it's like being asked to, to learn how to juggle. You know, you're you're kind of, especially the fact that like two weeks before, uh, you're introduced to JavaScript and a for loop and a, and you know any of those types of things, uh, you didn't know any of it. So you know now you're like already kind of just okay. We can I can I can sort of do this and we can get sort of into it. Uh, but it's still like a little little juggle with uh, with learnings, you know. And about one week later, our teachers decided to throw React, the React library at us, and that felt kind of like we were with fire. Um, we didn't really have a stable foundation yet in JavaScript, in plain vanilla JavaScript, so when we hit any snags or got through some issues, it was a little bit challenging, but yeah, we definitely yeah, made it through. Uh, and then, of course, they're like, all right, let's do Angular. And that's like, you know, why don't you try juggling with change laws now, now that you've got the fire figured out? Uh, and so for me, it kind of felt like, you know, becoming comfortable with being uncomfortable all the time. And, uh, you know, you get kind of used to the pace of just like so much information overload, but then you're still building things, things are working, things are coming together. Our cohort started really bonding around that time. So we kind of got, um, we started developing that sense of, um, you know, support within the developer community, and I think that's really important. So that was kind of a really pivotal time for us, was struggling with the chase logs. Uh, and then going from basically spending three weeks in JavaScript and, uh, and going through different frameworks and learning, uh, you know, at the beginning, uh, you know, how to write just plain HTML, and then four weeks later, how to, you know, program and uh, framework like an MVC framework like Angular. It was uh, definitely a lot. And then we uh, jumped into WordPress. Uh, and it was, you know, just such a massive change um, from, you know, going from, you know, working in kind of your own singular, you know, my, okay, I kind of get, get JavaScript now at this point. Like, I sort of understand what I'm doing. I, I, you know, three weeks ago, I was really struggling with this concept, and now, I nailed that concept. That is locked in now. You know, okay, React was really tough, but now I get the cyclical nature. I understand staking props. I get all that now. You know, and like then you move into PHP and uh, WordPress gaming, and you know, kind of going in such a completely different direction while you're still trying to understand all the lessons that you just learned in JavaScript. So it's uh, you know felt very very overwhelming, like you were just being handed kind of just everything all at once. There it is. Yeah. Um, for me, it was a little bit different because I had already been really interested in WordPress for a while. So I felt like I was kind of like juggling. We kind of had under control because I was ready to focus on PHP. And uh, I felt like it was actually a little bit easier after having some JavaScript to kind of see programming patterns and kind of just jump into it. So uh, in contrast to Cameron, I was like kind of in heaven at that point. Uh, I definitely recommend this if you get a chance to try and juggle with it. Everything about it is great. Um, I think uh, you know, really, like going through everything, you kind of get into like Ellen said, you get into this situation where you're feeling, um, you know, you start to feel comfortable with your discomfort. You start to feel like you know, not knowing something, not getting it on the first try makes a, you know, is okay. And you really get like this, you know, oh, kind of, um, you know, you settle into a nice rhythm with, with the pace, with the, you know, because it is so fast paced and with what you're going through, that it is, you know, you, you kind of just start to feel okay. And, and you're really like going through a big change in that time. Um, that, we kind of actually, um, that was right around where we were working on um, our portfolios and, like we had basically at this point, I think we had five, pro uh, five projects that we were revamping and going back and fixing all the silly mistakes that we made three weeks ago, and you know that kind of stuff. So it was a good chance to really solidify the knowledge that we had. Um, then we got into our uh, community projects. Yeah, so our community projects.
community projects really helpful, like the resolution, because we really were able to take all the tools that we learned and come together as a group and really deliver a project for a real client. So we were able to work with the UX design students at RED and take their prototype and really develop the site from scratch using a custom WordPress theme. And yeah, it was an awesome experience because of the mutual benefits, both for the client, they got this well thought out design and like the framework of the website being built out. And then we just learned so much about the group dynamic. Yeah, it was, um, it was a really great experience. Um, we got to use all of our coding like experience and weave it all together to actually build something that worked. Um, and in the end, it ended up being that our coding skills were actually solid. We were able to troubleshoot and actually get things to come together. But that Git ended up being <laughs> more of an issue with merge conflicts and kind of having to learn that workflow. So that was kind of a really cool kind of piece to finish on was that we saw that we had actually achieved a certain level of like technical skill level. We were able to build things, but then um, you know learning Git at that point was difficult. But it was also just like uh, it was kind of an okay piece to be ending on, and it, it turned out really well. Yeah, we spent, I think, the, you know, previous to getting into our community partners, we, you know, our projects with them, we had spent like 10 weeks going literally from knowing, uh, you know, very little or absolutely nothing to, uh, you know, really launching a, launching a site, launching a, a, you know, an entire um, redesign from start to finish. We were giving, we were given prototypes and envision, and we were, you know, it wasn't, we weren't given like the, a live site that we could look behind, oh, okay, I see how they did this, now I can, replicate that or something like that. You know, it was a full redesign and um, going through the QA process as well with our uh, UX partners and uh, you know, uh, going from, from there and actually uh, some of our, our teams are actually still working with their uh, partners, their community partners to actually launch these sites uh, for them. So it's not just like, you're not walking out of these um, programs with just you know, kind of know how to make a to-do app. Um, you walk out with like a full, you know, a full knowledge, um, an ability to actually deliver on the product, and an ability to deliver with uh, to a to a client. Um, and I think that's uh, that's a fantastic thing. Um, so yeah, that's our information. If you guys want, um, we're all active on Instagram. I have lots of fun for that. <laughs> so yeah. So you had a very intense course in development on both, I guess, PHP and uh, JavaScript. Mm -hmm. Did they cover testing at all, or are you just like whatever? I, uh, not an in-depth covering of testing. Not like you know how to like sit down and do do a lot of testing. But we worked a lot with um, Gulp and task managers, and um, and working on like you know kind of monitoring your monitoring your development, making sure that you are that everything's working as you're going through. So I think like. You know, as as I've left the left the you know the, the program and I'm building new things, I'm learning more and more because of what I what I've learned there about testing and how to implement good tests and how to you know write pure functions as opposed to you know, uh, you know impure functions and things along those lines. And actually call that use different libraries. So I think, it, I think it gives you a really solid base to then like go in and dive into the you know and really. Um, there will be times you doubt yourself. Remember that when you're doubting yourself. Uh, and, and, and realize that it's totally normal and it's totally okay and the world is not on fire. Uh, and that, you know, it's, it's hard, but, but you can do it. I think that was like, there were definitely times where I was kind of like 
what am I doing? I know nothing. My brain is mush. And, you know, I think that, that kind of mentality would have helped me push through it. I mean, not that it did. Do you they pay you for doing this? Do they pay us yeah. for doing this? Yeah. No. no. <laughs> Yeah. It's not supposed to be like, <laughs> How much time do you have uh, TA there or you know, support for your program? How yeah. many couples is that? During um, like React, Angular, and WordPress, there was always like a third person around, typically, to kind of help support us. Um, and then we also just worked together a lot. Like We realized you know, there was some things that we, we couldn't figure out on our own, but that actually just collaborating, we often were able to troubleshoot a lot of issues without having to reference the teacher, which was really great. They really encouraged us to like like teach each other. Like if one person in the class got it, they were encouraged to like share that information with other people. And I think that's a really important skill to have, and it's kind of like relevant to what a real dev environment is like. And um, yeah, we kind of we really integrated that. I think like the like. And the nice thing was that everybody had, um, you know, like people had very obvious skill sets, and when you were struggling, you could go to another one of your cohort uh, members and, and say, "Hey, I, I don't fully get this," um, you know, and work with them, uh, you know, while they were solidifying their knowledge, and then you could do the same for somebody else as well. Okay, one last question. So now that you have learned all of this stuff, um, what's the plan? Um, moving forward in terms of how are you going to continue to keep learning now that you're out of grad? Well, I think personal projects is huge. And that's one thing that they actually didn't emphasize maybe as much that I think like now that I'm done, I'm realizing it's really important. It's just like having something that you're really passionate about and continuing to build because it's being in all those awkward scenarios when you come up with a really great idea and you want to make it work that you kind of realize that what your limitations are and then you kind of have some understanding of how you can teach yourself. So that's when you kind of, I think, yeah. you know, excel. So personal projects, definitely. Yeah, personal projects, um, you know, I think a big part of it is uh, developing a community as well and yeah. learning from your peers. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's definitely such a, a great way to, to work and coming to places like this and learning about them. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so learning is a continual thing. So I think that's always great. All right, thank you so much. Others, but I find for the most part the public is largely unaware when they're using location services. 
Um, the biggest example of a location service is Google Search. If I type in coffee shop, it's going to find coffee shops near me, not a great espresso place in Rome. And most people never really think why that is. They just expect it to work that way, and it does, so they don't question why. Um, so I'll come back to that because you can use that as a bit of magic going forward. Um, so we'll kind of merge this idea of the narrative and technology, and I, I really like it because to me, creative people and people who are interested in games and films and stories, it's a natural fit with technology, but a lot of times there's a lot of friction between those groups. I, I, I'd like to kind of bring those groups together a bit more. Um, so I see the mobile phone as an amazing storytelling tool, and you know I see it as a sensory experience. Um, mostly vision and sound, I suppose you could send someone to the sea and say smell the salty air, but the tech really isn't there for most things other than vision and sound. So, I mean, the screen. The screen is beautiful and it's hard not to look at the screen and we look at screens all the time. But if you're telling a story about a place and you send someone to that place, the last thing you want them to do is be staring at the screen. You could send them to the Colosseum and you're like, look at the Colosseum and read all about it. And really, the scene is that and your story is the scene where this amazing piece of architecture is. So it can be a crush. It's an amazing tool, but it's a tool to tell the story. So if it's impeding that, I advise not using it. Um, on the other hand, audio is fantastic. Uh, you can have a narrator in your ear that knows about where you are, knows about the story, and can tell you about the scene that you're walking through. So you can use you know, ambient sounds, minimal audio cues, whispers, things like this. But it's, it's really the difference of a very gifted, tour guide who's telling you about a place or going to a beautiful place in a city and having someone hand you a piece of paper and reading it. So I, I really think audio is quite a strong uh, tool to be used for telling narratives when people are out in the world. Um, there's a few things about the technology and the narrative that need to kind of come together. The technology is not perfect and a lot of times it's dealing with folks who are used to, um, not used to dealing with technology. Uh, they tend to expect technology to be perfect and they expect it to be extremely accurate. And with location, they'll take beacons as an example, or GPS. Oftentimes the expectation is that they will be able to track you perfectly within millimeters of a place and perfectly as you leave that place. And there's things like interfering signals, there's people who have different versions of Bluetooth on their phone, they might have different settings, whether that's Wi-Fi, mobile, GPS turned on or partially, so they get varying results. Um, I remember talking to a guy who using GPS to guide people on a theater experience and they wanted on different sides of the block because they were all using different map providers and then it had picked it at different spots. And to me that, that was a bit of a, a failure relying too much on the technology and not the narrative. But he neglected to use what I think is the most important tool when you're doing that and, and you need to use it which is the human. Um, the humans are amazing at doing many, many things and they can't be neglected and I'd say they're obviously the most important part of that triangle between the tech and the narrative. Um, in that case, there was a big garage door and a person standing next to it. So instead of sending first someone to the GPS point on the phone, it's that idea of sending them to a, a general location and having them find and discover those things. You know, having people engage in an act of discovery or using their imagination a bit really helps people be drawn into this experience. Or the idea of you know having someone walk on a very busy road. And, and saying something suggestible like the woman with the cell phone is spying on you. Now if you're on a busy road and you know the time of day, more than likely there's at least one woman with a cell phone and you won't know which one it is, but it makes you feel in the experience and it really draws you into that, into that um, fiction. Um, so I would say using the humans to make the imperfections of the technology fun and enjoyable <laughs> and that's a, a very good way to go. Uh, Quick show, and, and, well actually shout out, does anyone know where this is roughly? Don't have to be accurate, there's a flag that's here in blue. <laughs> London, London. London, okay, great. Of course, and Regent Street. Regent yeah. Street, there you go. And what time of day do you think it is roughly? <laughs> sure, yeah, they're getting out of work, right? And the weather. <coughs> Got jackets, some of them, not some of them, not, so maybe like 10 or so. And there's a few, there's a few shops close by. So how much of that does their phones already all know? Like all of it, right? So if the phone knows it, the story should be able to know it, and the story should be able to adapt to the surroundings. And really what that is is context. And location to me is 
Location is a big part of context, but context is really the most important thing. So is it raining? Is it sunny? Is it a weekend? Are they with their friend? Is it an Indian restaurant? Is it an Italian restaurant? Do you know the name of the cafe? All those things can be used in the context of the story because you have this incredibly powerful device to work with which already knows all of those things. Um, it's very difficult to get people to engage with these experiences for the most part. They don't know they exist. And the trouble with defining them is when you, when you come up with something new, what people tend to do is they use this technique of a handle and a twist. And the handle is something you already know, and the twist is why it's different. So you might say something like it's Angry Birds except with flying squirrels, or it's Super Mario except this time he's Canadian, or maybe it's Mission Impossible except they're on the moon. Um, so I'm always looking for new ways to, to find ways to introduce that to, uh, to people. Um, one other quick point that I totally missed, but the participant's perspective is extremely important on the narrative side of things, and the tech plays into this as well. So imagine you're back up on that castle wall. If you're gonna talk about the past, and you can say to them, imagine there's an army charging towards you and it's pouring rain. And that's fine, because you definitely want people to engage their imagination and then use that to continue in the story. But if you're dealing with the present, it's a much different experience because the present, I'd say for the most part, there is no normal boundary between an actor and the audience. And the story only happens because of your participation and it's only happening for your benefit. So I wouldn't ever ask someone to look at the, the stars at noon. It doesn't make sense and it will kill that as a question of disbelief. So um, how do we engage public awareness and how do we make people aware that these experiences exist? And for people who want to get involved, how do they know that they can and, and that are people actually doing these things? So I'm going to just play a quick video. This is a um, group called Circumstance in the UK. I'm a big fan of their work, and if you ever get a chance, I would highly recommend you to see one of their things. same thing with someone who has no idea what it is is very challenging. And um, having the recently initiated describe it to the uninitiated is a great way to do that. So grabbing testimonials from people, and I just love that one in the middle. It was like being inside the story and creating it at the same time. Now I probably could have sat around with people for a month trying to come up with something that's that good and that's, I don't know, I suppose descriptive, but I don't know, it just kind of stumbled out of someone's mouth after she finished one of these experiences. And Wow, that, that did it way better than I ever could. So it's um, it's certainly worth worth capturing that information. Um, finally, it's empowering the storytellers. I find that on the web, they're quite empowered, and film, they're quite empowered, and certain game studios are also quite empowered. They have the tools to be a direct part of the process. On the app space, definitely not. I don't think. And finding ways for people who are very good at stories, very good at narrative or experience be able to participate and use these types of technologies without involvement as the engineer is crucial to moving this medium forward. Um, if you've worked in this field, this is very common and very normal looking to you. Uh, a lot of waiting around for the content people, for the tech guys, then you finally get to this point where both groups are waiting on each other. It's very expensive. They're both, they cause a lot of friction potentially. Um, you don't get nearly as many iterations out of, the, out of the story person and you won't necessarily get the best product in the result. So basically that's what me and the other two guys that work with work on. We create an offering tool 
that lets people iterate on their story, goes to a template on their phone, engineers in parallel and designers can style that out and work on that to create their own experience. But the idea is I want more people to be doing these things. I strongly believe that this is a space for the taking and there's enough room for everyone at the moment. Um, the other part is I think it's the neglected part of what will be the AR mixed reality side of things. You're gonna take the best of VR, you're gonna take the best of context aware, and that's gonna be AR. So you might be really good at VR, but when you're up out walking in, in the street and you've got all of this information, you should know how to use it. And so I think that this is that side of what will, will be in eventually our future. Uh, so you can contact me there, there's our website and Twitter. Um, happy to answer your questions. Thanks very much. Thank you, Peter. That is a very interesting use of mobile technology. And before you kind of mention it at the end, uh, that is kind of an early form of AR. Yeah, that's impressive. Thank you. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Peter? Uh, like, have you gamified it, or is it more like a tour guide sort of mode, or where like if you were to go right instead of left, like or you need to check a checkpoint, like a, almost like a capture the flag or something, would it change the story? Or? Yeah, we, we actually started as a game company and made a, there's a location-based game called Coderunner that used location services as opposed to GPS, so we work in any city. So say it, it starts at a bank, but I don't care which bank. Um, we just got funding to do another project, which will do much more of what you're saying. Um, I think it, it's called Recollection, which will be coming out maybe autumn, I'm not 100% sure, but anytime, sometime within the year, I don't know, maybe next year. But yeah, we've got fun with that. Anyone else? I'm pointing to you. Uh, is there <laughs> a big difference between indoor, your accuracy indoor and outdoor, as well as web, web access and application data apps? Is there a big difference between the accuracy of the information? Uh, you know, so much has to do with environment as well. Like there's points that are in downtown Vancouver where your GPS just gets a little wonky in. And I don't know why, but if you go there, it consistently happens. If you bring up Google Maps, if you bring up you know any number of location-based apps, um, beacons. There are different types of beacons. There are different standards of Bluetooth on phones. Some of them bounce off glass, so that one you might put one behind the gong, and it it will bounce off the glass, and it'll appear much closer than it is. I think it's just a limitation of the technology at the moment, more than anything. With the uh, immersive side of this, are you uh, using the mobile phone as more of like a second screen, something that is giving you like contextual information, or do you uh, intend or have you already used it more as like a, like a viewfinder to augment your your reality around you, like to hold it up and actually have stuff up here? Uh, we're working with a company who is doing something like that. Um, for the most part, that'll be their first venture into that, but really what our goal is, um, you know, I'm an engineer, I work with another engineer, and I work with a screenwriter, and our whole goal is to make sure that the screenwriter can iterate on stories that are cool, that happen in ways that, that he doesn't have to come to us to ask those questions. It's, it's about giving those creative people an avenue to tell the story, and then if you need more tools, add more tools. Uh, one last question. We make a tool, our, our company's called Moment.io. Um, there's, there's another, uh, there, depending on what you want to do, there, there are other tools as well. Um, there's a lot of walking tours, like samples that you can, that you can use. Uh, so it depends on the type of technology you want to use and how much. We started as a game company, so we kind of, we, we, all our templates are in Unity. So Unity, our Unity templates know how to communicate with their authoring tools. So when you open one up, First thing it does is say, has any new experience been authored? And grab that and any associated media, and then brings it right down to the farm. So it, it, it just is a way to get rid of the process of saying, here's 10 documents, and then you code that, and they're like, that's all wrong, and then you do that 60 more times. And um, it's a big manual broken process, and so that's what we want to get rid of. But if you're looking to do just like, here's a point, here's a piece of media, there are things out there. So it depends on what your requirements are. That was in the details. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you. That was great.
spiel of what we're about. But just before that, I just want to welcome Irina over here. She wants to talk a bit about Cascadia Fest. Hi, how many people have heard of a Cascadia Fest? Gavin's already got a ticket, I know. That was better ticket. Cool. Um, uh, I'm one of the organizers. I'm one of the only Canadian organizers of the Cascadia Fest. So it's a three day conference. Um, Cascadia CSS, JavaScript with no days, taking place in semi in Washington. It's literally across the wall, body of water from White Rock. You can see White Rock from there. You can also see semi um, we're selling tickets on the 30th, and I wanted to let you know that we're selling tickets on the 30th, and I want more Raker brands to come. There's only about 100 of them left, if not less, so mark your calendars, and they're going to be sold out at 9 a.m. right when the tickets start. So I um, wanted to tell you that. Um, please do come out if you would like. Really, it's honestly one of the best conferences I've ever been to, and I've been to about five now, and honestly, like, I would always want to come back to Cascadia. It's just like such a home, such a home community, and then you get to do JavaScript on the side, which is like great. So there's that. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> community stage, and we've been kind of transforming it into a bit of a Toastmasters for software developers or the tech community over here. So we we want to be welcoming. We want it to be like low pressure and really encouraging for anybody that wants to speak. So if you want to share experiences, share what you know, please come see us. Uh, if you're interested in speaking and giving any ends on workshop, contact one of the organizers, it's me, there's two over here, and there's Avinia right back there, and Phil, right there, over there. Or you can also send us a message on Meetup, or any of our social addresses you can find on our poster over there, or getting on the channel. Uh, also, if you believe you have actually nothing to talk about, you're probably wrong. I'm thinking of a bit of an imposter syndrome. So, and get in touch with us and we'll convince you otherwise. Okay? And on another note, uh, we're looking for some volunteers. If anybody is good at video editing or anything like that, you might have seen that we have some videos on YouTube, and it can take a, a while to get up there. And one of our volunteers that's working on that right now is going to be leaving soon, so if anybody would love to do that, we'd be really happy. Uh, if somebody would, love, would like to help redesign our uh, website too, we actually have one. Uh, there isn't much there, so we, we're hoping to actually have something interesting there that's actually useful. And that's the story, folks. So we're closing at 8.30, but until then, mingle, have fun. <laughs>